Good evening everyone and welcome to Synod Prayers for Tuesday the 1st of June. I hope that you were able to enjoy some of the sunshine that we've been having recently and the bank holiday. And it's great to be back with you. Um, last week I struggled to connect because I was uh, in a caravan in the middle of a field uh, in Rutland. So our opening words of praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh God, make haste to help us. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light to my path. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy to my heart. How sweet are your words to my taste. They're sweeter than honey to my mouth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And Tuesday evening psalm is Psalm 121. I look up to the mountains and the hills, longing for God's help. But then I realise that our true help and protection is only from the Lord, our Creator who made the heavens and the earth. He will guard and guide me, never letting me stumble or fall. God is my keeper, and he will never forget nor ignore me. He will never slumber nor sleep. He is the guardian God of his people, Israel. Yahweh himself will watch over you. He is always at your side to shelter you safely in his presence, his protection, protecting you from all dangers both day and night. He will keep you from every form of evil or calamity as he continuously watches over you. You will be guarded by God himself, and you will be safe when you leave your home, and safely you will return. He will protect you now, and he will protect you forever. Amen. And our reading this evening is um, taken from Deuteronomy, chapter 12, reading from verses 1 to 12. These are the decrees and the laws that you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord your God gave to your ancestors and he has given you to possess, as long as you live in the land. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains, on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations that you are disposing, um, dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. You must worship the Lord your God in the, you must not, sorry, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. But you are to seek the place that the Lord your God will choose from among all tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, what you have vowed to give and your free will offerings, the firstborn of your herds and the flocks. There in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and shall rejoice in everything that you've put your hand to because the Lord your God has blessed you. You are not to do as we do here today, everyone doing as they see fit since you have not reached the resting place and the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. But you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. He will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you your burnt offerings, sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord. And therefore rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants and the Levites from the towns who have no land allotted to them or any inheritance of their own. So our um, song tonight is Yes, I Will which is by Eddie Hoagland and Jonathan Smith and Maya Fields and it's sung by Susie uh, James. Working all things out. 
And our Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 17, reading from verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine... Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God, except this foreigner? Then he said to them, then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus is travelling, as his was his wont, and he's on the border here between Samaria and Galilee and he enters as he enters the village just outside there he meets ten men and these ten men have bounded together because they have something in common they probably wouldn't normally have shared each other's company but they were lepers and it wasn't unusual for lepers to congregate with others because they were all outcasts from society and would have no other, le uh, other company than fellow lepers. And we see how these men had bounded together because of their common misfortune. But those normal racial and national barriers had been broken down. Normally, Jews would not associate with Samaritans, but in their common misery, national and other prejudices just vanish as they come together for support. They'd forgotten that they were Jews and Samaritans. What mattered was that they were men, human beings in need. And so together, this little band, they stood far off. They kept their distance because it was forbidden by law and custom to come near others for fear of infecting them. And so, in one, they lifted their voices. They perhaps heard of Jesus and of his healing powers. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And, and when Jesus sees them, moved by his compassion, he says to them, go show yourselves to the priests. It's remarkable that Jesus asked them to go to the priests while they were still lepers. But he did that and it shows both their faith and their obedience in the one that they called Master. In their desperation and in their hope for healing. 
And when Jesus told the men to go and visit the priest, he was telling them to go and get that certificate to rele of release, indicating them that they were now free from that dreadful skin di disease. And as they followed his instructions, they were cleansed. He didn't heal them on the spot. He didn't heal them in the distant future spot. He healed them as they moved, as they trusted, and as they obeyed his orders. And as I read this, I think, wow, that is really, truly stepping out in faith. Believing for the answer of prayer because Jesus has commanded it, even though their immediate current situation hadn't changed. As the writer of Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. These forgotten outcasts, they took Jesus at his word and they were rewarded for it with their healing. For as they went, they were cleansed. Just as God blessed the faith of those lepers to step out, so he will bless our faith. The commentator Robert Morrison says, it is as we go on the commanded road that we experience the commanded blessing. Let the church obey the Lord of the, uh, let the church obey the command of the Lord Jesus and with enthusiasm evangelize the nations and as she goes, she will be healed. Luke notes for us that only one out of the 10 lepers returns to give thanks. And he is the foreigner, not one of the Jews, but a Samaritan. He, as he was walking, realised he was healed. And so he returned with a loud voice to glorify God. He was the only one that came back to give thanks. And he was the unlikely one because he was a Samaritan, the outsider. But when he saw Jesus for who he really is, he turned back and he threw himself at Jesus' feet while praising God. And in doing so, he showed not only that Jesus comes for everyone, but perhaps how it's those that are on the margin of society that are most likely to see God's working through Jesus. It's sad, but sometimes the insiders often miss this, preferring to work within their own confines of the established institutions. Perhaps the Samaritan didn't have to return to the temple to the priest because that wasn't part of his culture. And perhaps for the other nine, they were so preoccupied with fulfilling what the law required, the religious bit, to go to the priest, that they fail to give thanks and praise to God, the source of their healing. Were they careless? Or were they carried away in their mad fury to show that their newly healed skin to those that he'd, they'd been separated from? Were they distracted by the celebration of one another? Were they ungrateful? Or were they just swept away with the possibility of their new life giving them healing? Or did they just simply forget? Or perhaps they would return later? Jesus says, we're not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? And Jesus' words here in verses 17 to 19 reveal for us, I think, a touch of sadness and perhaps surprise. The nine Jewish lepers who had been healed went away and yes, they were clutching that, that blessing to themselves of their healing. Only the Samaritan returned and Jesus rewards him, yes with healing, but beyond that with something even more, wholeness. Jesus says to the one who returns, your faith has made you well. And while the one who returned had that same experience of healing that the others had, he also has a deeper experience. 
The other nine lepers were healed. Their flesh had become um, normal again. But only one experienced that deeper wholeness that comes from Jesus. And in a way, that wholeness is so much more important than being healed. Now, gratitude is part of human nature, isn't it? And if we are to be whole people, it needs to be part of who we are. The other nine were merely healed, but one came back and he was made whole. And each one of us who believes in Christ has been rescued and healed. And we're the most blessed people on earth. Some days may be harder than others. Some seasons of our life may be turbulent and very painful. But gratitude isn't, it isn't uh, dependent on the situation. It isn't based on what we have or what we are, but on our relationship with God, who's pulled us out of that deep water, sets our feet on the rock and puts a new song of praise into our mouth. So let us pray using the words of the chorus, Give Thanks by Henry Smith. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Amen. And our New Testament song is the song of love. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we could have life through him. This is what real love is. It is not our love for God, it is God's love for us. He sent his son to die in our place to take away our sins. Dear friends, if God has loved us that much, we also should love one another. Let us pray. Loving creator of all, watch over us this night and keep us in the light of your presence. May our praise continually blend with the song of all creation until we come to those eternal joys which you promise in your love. Amen. Father God, we rest in you. Jesus the Son, we rest in you. Holy Spirit, we rest in you. Loving Father, for the things this day has, that have brought us joy, we give you thanks. Healing, Lord, for the things this day that have brought us sorrow, bring peace. Spirit of life, in the closing of this day, give us rest. O oh God, you create all things, drawing them to yourself. You made time, space and matter from nothing, and yet through them you give us life and meaning. May the words of our prayers, brought from nothing, rise to you as a sufficient offering of praise and thanksgiving. Amen. So as we um, continue with our prayers, we think of our East Midlands Synod and the churches that are within it. And tonight we pray for the ministers, the elders and the members of our churches in Leicestershire. We pray that where there is darkness, they would bring light to the glory of God's name. And we continue to pray for all those who are facing the challenge of COVID-19. We rejoice in the news today of no COVID deaths recorded in the UK. And we pray for the continual rollout of the vaccination programme and the tentative ways that we are starting to enjoy 
new freedoms. We pray, Lord, for guidance for the government and for all those that are advising them. And Lord, we pray for aid and relief for India in the battle against COVID-19. We continue to pray that the ceasefire in Palestine and Israel may hold, Lord, and peace may come to that land, that holy land. We pray for all those who are facing difficult decisions and for those who are facing mental health worries. With Celia, we continue to pray for her grandson, Alfie, and the family, praying for healing and wholeness. With Liz, for her 12-year-old great-nephew, Ryan. We thank you that Ryan has been discharged from hospital, and we ask, Lord, that he will be well enough for his next round of chemo. And Lord, that you would just lay your hand upon him, giving him strength. And we also pray, pray for Lizzie's daughter, Emma, who last week had her first round of chemotherapy and is now at home looking after her five-year-old son, Leon. Be with her, Lord. May she know you with her and may you accelerate that healing through the power of your Holy Spirit. We lift up to you, Prince, um, and with, with Prince, we pray for Cheryl. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless that couple as they face the future together. With Tom Schumann, we pray for his brother James, once again asking for healing in this situation. With Judith, we pray for Catherine, her niece, as she comes to terms with that prospect of surgery for breast cancer. Lord, we ask that you would give her wise people to come alongside her, encouraging her and supporting her as she journeys through this. We give you thanks that the Reverend Amanda Linney is on the road of recovery and we pray for her as she goes through various physiotherapy. And with Ankatea, we're thankful um, that she too is on the road of recovery. We pray with Roger for Pauline and we continue to pray for Louise for guidance as she continues to reflect on that important meeting. We pray for the Reverend Graham Maskery as he continues his treatment and Vera following her fall and for the Reverend Eric and Joan Allen. And in a moment of silence, we just lift up to you those known to us in need of prayer tonight. Lord, we do pray for healing and for wholeness, for well-being in each of these situations, according to your will. And we pray for comfort and peace for all those who are grieving. And especially at this time, we continue to think of the family and friends of the Reverend Malcolm Deacon, his wife, Steph, son, Julian, and daughter, Tess, Tessa, and their families. And also for those grieving for the Reverend Mal, sorry, I've got that twice. <laughs> Let us pray, as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is, is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
and let us also lift up uh, the family of the Reverend Michael Pevy, his wife June and their family as they grieve his loss too. So may the Lord bless us with his grace and fill us with his peace. God bless. Amen. <laughs>